An account by Albert Osman. An excerpt from the book Bigfoot, America's Abominable Snowman by Elwood D. Bauman. Published by Dell Publishing, 1975. Many strange letters crossed Andrew Genzoli's desk that fall, but one in particular really made him sit up and take notice. He published it to amuse his readers, then began to have second thoughts about the matter. Truth can often be stranger than fiction, and it would be hard to imagine anything stranger than the letter reproduced below. Editor's Mailbox, RR5 Langley, British Columbia. Editor, The Humboldt Times, Eureka, California. Dear Sir, I am interested in an article in the Agassiz Advance about tracks seen in California. Have you any pictures of these footprints or some description of them that you could send me? I claim to be the only living man that's seen a Sasquatch. In fact, I was kidnapped by one and lived with them for about six days before I got away from them. I claim they are human beings that for one reason or other got left behind from our civilization. But it's one thing about their feet that is not like a human foot today. I saw their feet close up. In the family that kidnapped me was one old man, one old lady, one boy, and one girl. So I guess I know what kind of feet they have, old or young. Your guess about size is about right. It's hard to estimate when you have nothing to compare them with. I always estimated that the old man, like I call him, would be about 8 feet tall and weight about 800 pounds, a hundred more or less. I hope to hear from you. Sincerely, Albert Ostman. Ginzoli decided that the letter was simply too far-fetched to have been written by a crank. It was so unusual that there had to be a ring of truth in it somewhere. Osman had read about the tracks in the Canadian newspaper Agaza's Advance, and John Green, Canada's foremost authority on the Sasquatch, was the editor of the Advance. Moreover, Agassiz was across the Fraser River from Langley, where Osman was now living. With a little sigh of relief, Ginzoli put Osman's letter into an envelope and mailed it to British Columbia. The letter came as no surprise to John Green. He had talked to a radio announcer the year before who had interviewed Osman and was convinced that his story was actually true. Green also went to see Osman. The old man's story defied all belief. Such things just didn't happen. And yet the Sasquatch expert confessed that he had to accept Osman's unbelievable story as the truth. Unless a man had actually lived with the Sasquatches, Green reasoned, he couldn't possibly know so much about them. Surely Albert Osman's account of being kidnapped by a Sasquatch must rank as one of the most unusual stories of the century. In the summer of 1924, Albert Osman was prospecting in the mountains of British Columbia. One morning he noticed that something had gone through his camp while he had been sleeping, but nothing seemed to be missing. The same thing happened the following night. This time, however, his backpack, which had been hanging on a branch, had been turned upside down, and his visitor had taken some preserves and pancake flour. The third night, Osman promised himself that he'd be ready for his intruder. After securely buckling the straps on his backpack, he crawled into his sleeping bag. He was fully clothed and his rifle was beside him. He intended to stay awake all night and find out exactly who his visitor was. In spite of his good intentions, he fell asleep almost at once. Sometime during the middle of the night, Osman had a rude awakening. He felt himself being picked up while still in his sleeping bag. Then he had the sensation of being slung over someone's shoulder. What's going on here, he asked himself, trying desperately to keep his wits about him. What's happening? Whatever it was that had picked Osman up now began walking at a very rapid pace. It breathed heavily and gave a slight cough when going up steep slopes. Going downhill, the creature dragged the sleeping bag behind him and moved even more rapidly. On the relatively level stretches, it seemed to be going at a trot. Poor Osman was desperately unhappy. He was also horribly uncomfortable. 
I was all hunched down on the bottom of the sleeping bag and I couldn't move, he recalls. I was sitting on my feet and my legs ached terribly. My sheath knife was underneath me and I couldn't get at it. Or I could have cut my way out. Almost all of Osman's life had been spent logging and prospecting in the mountains and forests of British Columbia. Although he had heard countless stories about the Sasquatch, he steadfastly refused to believe any of them. Even though he had seen their tracks and heard their high-pitched wailing whistles, he could not convince himself that such creatures actually existed. When I was in that sleeping bag, though, he now says, I knew that it was a Sasquatch that was carrying me, because there was no other creature that could do it. After what Osman guessed to be about three hours of fast traveling, they finally reached their destination. The Sasquatch dropped the backpack first, then the sleeping bag. Osman pulled himself out, but his legs were so numb that he couldn't stand up. Although it was still dark, he could see four creatures standing around him. They chattered constantly while Osman massaged his legs. The numbness in his legs finally subsided, and the prospector struggled to his feet, his hands firmly gripping his rifle. "'What do you fellows want with me?' he asked in a quaking voice. "'What are you going to do with me?' The only answer was another babble of chattering. Daylight comes early in the northern latitudes in summer, and it was quite light by five o'clock. Osman was now able to get a good look at his captors. They were all covered with hair and wore no clothes at all. He believed that they were a family group, father, mother, son, and daughter. The boy and girl seemed to be afraid of him. The mother didn't appear to be at all pleased with what her husband had dragged home. The old man, however, was apparently very proud of his conquest. He waved his arms about at a great rate and chattered nonstop. Escape was the first thing that came to Osman's mind. As the sun got higher, he saw that he was in a small valley surrounded by high mountains. On the southeast side, there was a V-shaped opening, and he guessed that was the only way to get in or out of the valley. The old man seemed to know what his prisoner was thinking. Leaving the group, he marched over to the opening and sat down. Well, that takes care of that, Osman sighed. Except for the fact that the old man guarded the opening, Osman was free to wander about as he pleased. He moved his belongings under two cypress trees beside the canyon wall and took stock of his situation. It wasn't good. He didn't know where he was. He had only six shells left for his rifle, which had been in his sleeping bag. The pack sack contained only enough food for a week, and most important, he didn't know what the Sasquatch intended to do with him. This was what worried him most. The next morning, the prospector decided to leave the place even if he had to shoot his way out. Shouldering his backpack, he picked up his rifle and headed for the opening in the wall. The old man immediately leaped to his feet and held up his hands as though to push him back. Get out of the way, Osman ordered, his rifle aimed at the giant's head. I'm going through. The old man grunted something and again pushed his hands toward him. I'm going through, Osman insisted, his rifle at the ready. There was another grunt and the giant took a menacing step toward Osman, both hands extended. The prospector hesitated. His 30-30 rifle was fine for deer, but did it have enough power to stop the Sasquatch? It wasn't hard to imagine what would happen if the bullets only wound him. Besides, the idea of murdering the man-like creature wasn't to his liking. There must be another way of getting out of here, Osman decided, and walked unhappily back to his camp under the cypress trees. While planning his escape, Osman made a close study of the Sasquatch family. This is a description of them in his own words. The old lady was a meek old thing. The young fellow was by this time quite friendly. The girl would not hurt anybody. Her chest was flat like a boy's, no development like young ladies. The young fellow might have been between 11 to 18 years old, about 7 feet tall and might weigh about 300 pounds, his chest would be 50 to 55 inches, his waist about 36 to 38 inches. He had wide jaws and a narrow forehead that slanted upward, 
round at the back, about four or five inches higher than the forehead. The hair on their heads was about six inches long. The hair on the rest of the body was short and thick in places. The women's hair was a bit longer on their heads, and the hair on the forehead had an upward turn like bangs. The old lady was over seven feet tall and would be about 500 to 600 pounds. She had very wide hips and a goose-like walk. She was not built for beauty or speed. A brassiere would have been a great improvement on her looks and her figure. The man's eye teeth were longer than the rest of the teeth, but not long enough to be called tusks. The old man must have been eight feet tall, big barrel chest and big hump on his back and powerful shoulders. His biceps on his upper arms were enormous and tapered down to his elbows. His forearms were longer than common people have, but well proportioned. His hands were wide. The palm was long and broad and hollow like a scoop. His fingers were short in proportion to the rest of his hand. His fingernails were like chisels. The only place they had no hair was inside their hands and the soles of their feet and upper part of the nose and eyelids. I never did see their ears because hair was hanging over them. If the old man were to wear a collar, it would have to be at least 30 inches. I have no idea what size shoes they would need. I was watching the young fellow's feet one day when he was sitting down. The soles of his feet seemed to be padded like a dog's foot, and the big toe was longer than the rest and very strong. In mountain climbing, all he needed was footing for his big toe. They were very agile. To sit, they turned their knees out and came straight down. To rise, they came straight up without help of their arms or hands. The old lady and the boy did most of the food gathering. The family lived on a type of grass with long sweet roots, nuts, berries, twigs of various kinds, and plants that Osman was unable to identify. Whether or not they ever ate meat, the prospector didn't know. He thought that the old man might be the hunter, but couldn't go out after game because he had to guard his captive. Naturally enough, Osman wondered whether the family might not be saving him for one of their Sunday dinners. There didn't seem to be any other reason for capturing him and holding him prisoner. This thought did very little to cheer him up. Like many woodsmen, Osman took snuff regularly. One afternoon, he gave a nearly empty can of it to the boy to see what would happen. The young fellow tasted it, made a wry face, and then carried it to his father. The old man seemed to like it. After finishing the tiny bit in the can, he licked the bottom with his tongue. From then on, Osman gave the old man a pinch or two of snuff each day. A plan was forming in his mind, and he knew that he was doomed if it didn't work. On the morning of the sixth day, the prospector had his first pot of coffee since his capture. Using the labels from his cans, some moss he had dried in the sun, and a few dry twigs he had gathered, he managed to make a fire large enough to get his pot boiling. The aroma of the boiling coffee interested the old man and the boy, and they squatted down about ten feet away from their prisoner. Osman's heart was in his throat as he ate his few remaining biscuits and drank his coffee. He was about to put his plan into effect, and it had to work. When he finished his breakfast, he opened a new can of snuff. He took a tiny pinch between his thumb and index finger, then offered the can to the old man. He did exactly as the prospector had expected. Seizing the can, he emptied the entire thing into his mouth and swallowed it in one gulp. It was a terribly cruel trick to play on him, Osman admits, but I didn't want to shoot him and have murder on my conscience. Within seconds, the old man was deathly sick. His eyes rolled in his head and he began to squeal in agony. Grabbing the pot of scalding coffee, he drank it down, grounds and all. It didn't help. The pulverized tobacco had turned his stomach into a flaming furnace. After writhing and rolling about on the floor of the valley for several minutes, the old man got to his feet and started staggering toward the spring for some water. This is it, Osman explained to himself. It's now or never. It took him only a few seconds to gather his belongings together and head for the opening at the bottom of the valley. 
He just made it. The old woman let out a piercing scream and rushed after him. As he came through the opening, Osman fired a shot over her head. She screamed again, turned around, and dashed back into the valley. Albert Osman was safe, but 33 years passed before he ever told anyone the almost unbelievable story of being kidnapped by a Sasquatch. Who would have believed me, he asks. 